everybody, and welcome to Charts with Dan. We have a great lineup this week. We're talking about what the movies were that were actually number one through number 10 at the box office this weekend. We're also going to be looking ahead. There have been so many release date changes. Are there more of those in wait, lying in wait for all of us movie fans? There are a lot of signs and indications that may point to uh, the fact that there are more delays coming up, but we're going to break all that down and a lot more box office stuff. But first, let's get to what movies were number one at the box office this weekend. And for the third time in its history, The Empire Strikes Back, the first sequel to Star Wars, is the number one movie. This is the third time it has been released and debuted at number one when it was obviously released the first time back in 1980 and the 1997 special edition. Disney put it out in many theaters, again, mostly drive-in theaters. They're driving the bulk of the revenue right now. It is the number one movie of the weekend, over half a million dollars uh, in its pocket. Uh, Disney actually has the top three spots this weekend because at number two is Black Panther, at number three was Inside Out. Uh, Relic is the number four movie of the weekend. Relic continues to prove that the horror genre is performing well as far as new releases. And again, this uh, is a film that was playing mainly at drive-ins. Now, we're going to see Relic again on the VOD charts for one service in particular. But this, along with The Wretched and a few other movies this summer, have shown that horror distributors are taking advantage of the fact that a lot of their movies are the only new movies that are being put out. Many of them are small movies. They're on such a smaller budget that they can afford to be released drive-in only. And they're racking up revenues that are equal to or perhaps better than they might have racked up had they been put out in a more traditional release structure. So Relic, an Australian horror film, uh, they're in the top five, the only new film in the top five this past weekend. At number five is Jurassic Park. And then when we look at six through 10, The Goonies is in the top 10 again there at number six, followed by Palm Springs, which debuted on Hulu this weekend and is a movie that I really enjoyed. I did not see Palm Springs at the drive-in this weekend. I actually watched it at home on Hulu and it is one of my favorite films of 2020. If you want to see my thoughts on it, there's a little card up at the top of the screen. You can click that. Uh, a big recommendation for me. I really wish that I could have seen it with an audience in a packed theater, but it's just not the world that we live in right now, and uh, it was still enjoyable to watch at home. Me and Mara on the couch, uh, we both enjoyed the movie a lot, so big recommendation for that. Looking at numbers 8 through 10, Jaws stays in the top 10, and then tied with Jaws is Gremlins, which was executive produced by Steven Spielberg. A lot of Steven Spielberg uh, movies, either as a director or a producer, in this top 10. And then uh, an another new film there at number 10, Most Wanted, starring Josh Hartnett, rounds out the top 10. Worth noting, again, studios themselves, who usually report these numbers, have not reported numbers in uh, many months now, a matter of months. So these are industry estimates. These are not coming straight from the studios. Uh, these estimates are provided by Deadline, who continues to do great box office reporting. So worth noting that these are not studio-reported numbers, but the estimates from the information collected by those in the industry. Uh, but it is great to see some form of box office information coming in every week, even if they're not official numbers. It will, be, it will also be interesting to see which movies get their box office tallies updated once studios do start reporting numbers and whether the changes that have been indicated these last several weeks are reflected in the totals for each of these films. Looking at uh, perhaps a happier time, definitely a happier time as far as theater owners are concerned because this was a big box office weekend, but let's look at a flashback going back to 1991. July 12th through the 14th, 1991, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And then at number two was 101 Dalmatians, the original animated one. This was how Disney got you to watch their old movies before Disney Plus existed. It was re-released in theaters at the number two spot in 1991. And then two really essential movies for the 90s, both released in the same weekend. Boys in the Hood by the late John Singleton and Point Break by Catherine Bigelow. Again, essential 90s films for very different reasons but they both open on the same weekend and, and it's always interesting to see how these these singularities happen sometimes these movies that have both gone on to have very storied legacies uh, were coexisted in the same space literally and were competing against each other i did not know that these two movies opened up 
uh, this at the same time. Very different films, but also movies that endure to this day for uh, uh, many, many different reasons. And then rounding out the top five, What About Bob, which is one of my favorite Bill Murray performances, also one of my favorite Richard Dreyfuss performances. Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, I love What About Bob, and there it was uh, there in the summer of 91, competing with all of those great movies. Uh, also, I just wanted to start pointing out some other notable moments. Uh, Tron opened at a disappointing number three back in this week in 1982. The summer of 82 had so many notable films. Tron was a box office disappointment when it opened. It would not become a cult classic, obviously, until much later. Also in this week, back in 1994, True Lies opened. It's hard to believe, though, that even though True Lies came out in 1994, so we're talking about 26 years ago, James Cameron has only made two movies since True Lies. Titanic, which came out three years following True Lies, and then Avatar, which now came out over a decade ago. So despite the fact that James Cameron is one of the most successful directors at the box office of all time, just three films since 1994 to his name. Of course, he's working on like eight of them simultaneously right now, so I guess he's going to make up for lost time with all the new avatars that we're supposedly getting in the years to come. Other notable moments, 2003 Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl had its first weekend at the box office uh, so you're looking at uh, it, it made about 43 45 million dollars in its first weekend but it actually opened earlier in the week it opened on Wednesday so by the end of that first weekend it had made uh, about 70 million dollars which was a massively surprising result uh, people were did not see that movie coming uh, Johnny Depp, of course, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor for that film. It would go on to spawn countless sequels. I say countless because we're still adding to that tally, and I don't want to date this video by putting a specific number on how many Pirates of the Caribbean sequels we've had. Uh, but yeah, summer of 2003, 17 years ago, Captain Jack Sparrow was taking the country by storm. And then back in 2011, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, almost a decade ago, wrapped up the Harry Potter film series and set a new opening weekend record that would, sorry Harry, only stand for less than a year because when the Avengers was released the next year in May of 2012, it would break the record that was set by Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. That record would then be broken by Jurassic World. Uh, we've done this math before, but uh, a record-breaking year uh, in a lot of ways at the box office back in 2011. So uh, in addition to looking at the top five for some flashbacks, I may just have a little fun and, and look at these notable moments because right now there's a lot more information looking backward than there is looking forward, and uh, it's just fun to relive these moments. Uh, let's see what people are watching outside of the drive-ins and the very few movie theaters that are open. Let's see what they're watching at home, at least on some of the major platforms starting with Amazon. The top 10 on Amazon, The King of Staten Island stays on top, a very popular movie still on Amazon, followed by Trolls World Tour, Sonic the Hedgehog, Jumanji the Next Level, and Game Night. These are all holdovers from last week's chart. Also staying on the chart are The Gentleman and Bad Boys for Life, but we got some new entries rounding out the top 10. We have Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, so it looks like a lot of people are doing the double feature, getting both new Jumanji movies in. Then Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, perhaps people still waiting for Tenet to come out, and 2019's animated version of The Addams Family, rounding out the top 10 movies that are in demand over on Amazon. Now let's look at what's going on over on iTunes, and we have a repeat at number one. The Outpost remains number one, still doing very well on iTunes, uh, a critical hit as well, followed by Trolls World Tour. 1917 has been on sale and comes in at number three, my favorite movie of last year. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Followed by Relic. Now, Relic we saw in the box office top five. It is also in the iTunes top five because it was released on VOD in conjunction with uh, when it was released in theaters. Here's a little hint towards something that you might see very soon. Very recently, Mara and I took a trip to the drive-in to our first movie experience in several months, and one of the movies we saw was Relic. So keep an eye open here, right here on the channel, for a little travelogue of our trip to the drive-in theater, as well as a review of Relic uh, and another movie we saw. It was a double feature, so uh, stay tuned. That's going to be some fun, hopefully some fun viewing for all of you coming up. Looking at the rest of the top five, uh, Archive, which is a new sci-fi film from Vertical Entertainment, rounds out the top five. Then we have Force of Nature and The Invisible Man, carrying over from last week. Then some movies that were on sale, Saving Private Ryan, 
one of my favorite movies of all time. That's benefiting from being on sale. Uh, Dunkirk there at number 10 similarly is on sale. So a lot of movies right there that you see regarding military and wars uh, at the top 10 for iTunes. And then there at number nine, it's a, it's what I call the Joe Star special because I know how much he loves these guys. The Impractical Jokers movie, which was a 99 cent rental this week, is there at number nine, which accounts for its placement. And again, really, if, if you know Joe Star at all, you know that, that he really likes nothing more than to just sit down and binge Impractical Jokers. So Joe may have bought that movie five or six times. That could also account for why it's so high up. Again, he loves those guys let's look at the top 10 over on netflix and Charlize theron had a movie that debuted this weekend the old guard and not surprisingly it debuts at number one on the netflix charts it's there at number one followed by dr seuss's the lorax then at number three is a film called only it's a film about a deadly virus and a couple forced to quarantine from it so not a lot of escapism going on there at number three over on netflix then you have desperados uh the 2010 paul rudd reese witherspoon comedy how do you no rounds out the top five also i was just looking up the last time jack nicholson appeared in a film he's not appeared in a movie now in 10 years so if you want to see the last movie that jack nicholson has appeared in it's that movie it's sitting there at number five that was a collaboration of course with nicholson's longtime director that's gotten him to a couple of oscars james l brooks probably one of the reasons why he was brought in for that film Looking at the rest of the top 10, Mucho Mucho Amor, The Legend of Walter Mercado, which is a new documentary feature from Netflix, is there at number six. And then we have four holdovers from last week, 365 Days. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry, The Town, and Double Jeopardy. So that's the top 10 on Netflix and a lot of the other VOD platforms. But the question that remains heavy on everyone's mind is when are new movies going to come out? We've gotten close a couple of times. Then those dates get pushed back. The countdown is on again. We're going to see the actual countdown here at the end of the show. But looking at the news and looking at a few signs uh, around the country and really around the world this week, it may be a little bit longer until we're able to settle in and watch new films. And there are a few stories that I wanted to bring up that point to the fact that we may see a wholesale pushback of release date changes yet again in the near future. The first story I want to reference is something from MKM Partners, an announcement they made. They are market analysts. They look at the box office landscape. They make recommendations on the stocks for the different theater chains, etc. cetera. Uh, they lowered their estimated earnings for the 2020 box office. And of particular note was one of their quotes that they made, that they stated uh, when projecting the future uh, for the box office industry, quote, we place a low likelihood of tenant opening on August 12th, given a rising number of COVID-19 cases in key areas such as California, Texas, and Florida, along with the slowed reopening of the New York City economy. In our view, it would be surprising to see theaters able to reopen nationwide before September at the earliest. Now, again, this is not a theater chain. This is not uh, the National Association of Theater Owners, uh, but this is a, a firm, a company whose job it is to look at the landscape and to make projections about future earnings. Uh, and I think it is an indicator that at least economically, when you look at Wall Street, when you look at investors, they are preparing for the possibility or perhaps the eventuality that the theatrical market is going to be shut down for many more weeks to come. Now, we have no official official word on any of the films that are scheduled to be released currently in July and going into September. Obviously, we're coming up on a lot of those dates pretty quickly. There was news that Warner Brothers might be reevaluating everything after the July 4th holiday, which we are now about a week removed from. There's no official word on exactly what is going to happen. Uh, but this is an indication that many of the market analysts are anticipating that the films that are scheduled for an August release, including Tenet, uh, could very possibly be pushed back along with maybe everything else on the schedule, not just for July, but for August as well. Another story is a deal that was done over at AMC. We've talked about the fact that AMC, despite being one of the biggest theater chains in the world, has been struggling mightily, perhaps because of that, because they have so many theaters, they have so much overhead, and are now accruing so much debt. AMC announced that they have come to a new deal. They have restructured their debt to stay afloat through next spring. So this would anticipate the possibility of a worst case scenario where theaters stay closed through the end of the year into 2021. 
Uh, this includes delaying interest payments, bringing in new loans and debt uh, to provide a cash infusion reportedly of around $300 million. So again, not an official announcement from AMC, but you have analysts now that are preparing for the possibility that movies could be pushed into the fall. You have AMC now uh, restructuring their debt and bringing in a cash infusion to ensure that, that if they were to remain closed throughout the rest of this year, that they would have the resources, hopefully, for them to do so. So again, no big announcements either way, but you see preparations made both by analysts and by one of the major theater chains for an extended shutdown. And then just today here in the state where I live, California, the governor, Gavin Newsom, announced that all movie theaters statewide had to be closed today. Uh, indoor movie theaters. This was after a three-week closure in L.A. County was ordered last week. Um, that would have had theaters opening up around the end of this month, July 31st, right around the time Unhinged is supposed to open, which is still technically the first nationwide release that's scheduled. Uh, so we were already working on a pretty small margin for these movies hitting their dates. There's been no end date announced for this closure order from Gavin Newsom for the state of California. So you basically have California movie theaters, uh, indoor theaters, out of commission indefinitely at this point. There is no time given, and that's probably because we don't know how long the surge is going to last here in the state of California. This is about stemming the tide. This is about trying to get those case numbers down, about trying to get that positivity rate down. And one of the things that you have to wonder is at what point is the studio going to have to, going to be forced essentially to say, we can't take a chance that theaters are still going to be closed when our movie's going to come out, or we can't take the chance that even if theaters open right before that no one's going to show up because we still don't know how many people are going to go back to the theaters. We are now just a, a, a little less than a month under the the next scheduled opening date for Tenet. And reportedly the eyes of Hollywood are watching Mulan and are watching Tenet. And where they go, all of the other movies will follow. So a, a lot of signs, again, pointing to a, a very real possibility that in the next days or weeks that we are going to see yet again a wholesale push of movie dates that are currently scheduled. And just as a reminder, some of the movies that this would affect include an Unhinged, as I mentioned, Tenet, Antebellum, Mulan, Bill and Ted Face the Music, and yes, The New Mutants. We are now officially, I think you can put The New Mutants on a release date danger zone, although I feel like New Mutants has lived its life in a release date danger zone. But that is a movie that is scheduled for August that if these pushes and changes keep uh, pushing movies back, it could affect that new dates. That includes not just those major films that are scheduled for August release, but also the films that are scheduled in September and October that would potentially have to accommodate and make room for those movies to, to, to shift to those release dates. We've already seen one major 2020 fall movie push to 2021. Halloween Kills announced this week that they are moving out of this year entirely, that they will be releasing a year later than anticipated in next October. And this could be the first domino to drop. We saw this with some of the summer movies. We're now seeing it with our first major fall release that has bowed out of this year entirely. One of the things they cited was that it could potentially have what they called a compromised movie viewing experience. They want audiences to enjoy the film. As a matter of fact, they announced that when it is released in 2021, that it is going to get an IMAX release. So they are obviously invested in a premium theatrical movie going experience for those fans. Uh, but we are now seeing the summer slowly ebbing away and now films in the fall pushing to 2021 and these signs i think indicate that um it's not going to be a surprise at all if we see another big push coming down the road uh, again if everyone had their druthers including me we could dry you know these cases everyone that was sick would get better and we could all return to life as normal that would be wonderful but that's just not the world that we live in and so um, Hollywood, you can, as we can see, continues to struggle, and the movie business continues to struggle. Um, yes, we want those theaters open as soon as possible, but it has to be safely, and I think that is first and foremost in the mind of the studios and of the people that are releasing the films is, yes, you want to provide a home for film lovers. I would love to get back into the theater, and I want to as soon as it is safe to do so, but you have to provide a safe environment. 
and progressively as it is shown tragically uh, it is just not able to be done right now here in the United States this is a story that has much yet to be written and this show won't be about this story every week it really can't be because some weeks there's just not really a whole lot to say about it Uh, but it is really the box office story that's happening right now and so obviously as any updates come in we'll cover them here on the show Uh, but keep an eye on the films that are scheduled for late July and August because they may be relocating yet again very very soon let's look at the countdown with a question mark the countdown to new movies and this may change next week this may change later tonight we don't even know but currently we are 18 days from the release the scheduled release at least of unhinged so we're again less than three weeks away from the alleged release of this movie it was supposed to come out originally this past weekend at one point in its life cycle it was scheduled for a july 10th release as a matter of fact we're coming up on the original release date for tenant Tenet was scheduled to open this Friday, the 17th. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, but we're now cruising past not just the summer, re- uh, the release dates for spring movies and some of the summer movies, but we're cruising past now second and third release dates for a lot of them. Uh, but 18 days from the scheduled release of Unhinged, which would be the first major film back in theaters nationwide. Also, allegedly 46 days away from the release of New Mutants. As I mentioned, I think we have to officially put a yellow alert out on this release date. It's, it is looking less and less likely that it's going to hit this, but as of right now, The New Mutants is scheduled to be released 46 days from today. We are less than two months away. Will New Mutants stick to this release date, or will, will we continue to push it and push it and push it? Nobody knows, but right now... Uh, less than 50 days away from the alleged release of this film. So that's all the box office news I have for you today, but I also wanted to share something with you from one of the shows I do over on Patreon. You can find me over at Patreon, patreon.com slash Dan Merle. And a really fun thing that we've been doing now for about a month and a half at this point is a show called Dan Decides, where we pick a topic. This happens twice a month. Uh, This is streamed live to all patrons, and then everybody can watch it back if you can't watch live. We pick a topic, and I either rank something or just talk about the best a best of, a worst of. Uh, Really just a place to share my opinion and do some really cool stuff. Um, It is hosted by one of my moderators over on Patreon, Jack Shipley, who is a longtime Screen Junkies fan as well and it's been great to bring him into the fold uh and and have him over uh as well over here on patreon as as i've helped build that community but this past weekend i was joined by my wonderful partner mara uh, and jack as we ranked the star trek films my favorite one of my favorite franchises of all time and i wanted to share a clip of that with you just so you could get a little bit of a taste of that show uh and the kind of stuff that we're doing over there so here's a clip from this week's dan decides this is what happens when you bring up star trek into darkness on a a live stream about star trek so i'm gonna go out on this clip i hope you enjoy it we'd love to see you over on patreon at patreon.com slash dan merle Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week here on Charts with Dan. And to my favorite viewer watching at home, get well soon. I'll see you next time. That's Mm. why I hate Into Darkness was Trek 09 did such a good job of divorcing itself from the previous continuity and saying, like, these are our characters. We're planting our flag. This is our universe. You end the movie with them going out into space, the great unknown, where no one has gone before. You know, it's just like... Here we go. We can do whatever we want. And it's like, and what do we want to do? Remake the second movie, which was already great. And we're just going to, that was so disappointing to me. Like, I get why people who don't love Star Trek, like Into Darkness, but like as a Star Trek fan, I was so angry because it's like, you did such a good job of starting a new franchise. And the first thing you do is do a cheap knockoff of the best star trek movie ever made like when you could have done anything in the world you could have gone anywhere you could have done anything and you're just like let's just redo wrath of khan like that's the laziest cheapest most expected thing you could possibly do and And they didn't even do that well well, it's just oh it was infuriating you have other great just fantastically great things in that movie though like the score incredible like uh, the fine. piano rhythm that that happens when you get the first introduction of john harrison right um, 
the action. I love uh, when you do see the Enterprise is getting pulled in by Earth's gravity and, the, you know, everything is is going crazy. I mean, because, again, they love destroying ships. Right. Yeah. But it just, and uh, Klingons, uh, bringing in the Klingons really cool. in the universe. Yeah. yeah. So, really cool. so many good things. Well, and I made the, I, we made this point in the Honest Trailer, and it was one of my, uh, one of my suggestions is that Into Darkness ends the exact same way that Star Trek 09 ends. Like, Star Trek 09 ends with them going like, here we go, we're going on the mission. And then they go to Into Darkness, and they go through all this shit, and then it ends with him again, like, clapping bones on the shoulder and going like, here we go, we're going on a mission. Like, you just did that in the last movie. Right. You said you were going to go on the mission, and now, and then, and then in Beyond, which I like, like, they immediately destroy the enterprise like we never get to see the enterprise we get to see them before they go on a mission right. and we get to see them like two and a half years into a mission but they never get to the boldly go part it's always right. like what but what blows up and i think that was really and i like beyond that way more than i like in the darkness but that was always frustrating for me was they didn't seem at all interested in the whole exploration part which is what star trek is well and it's a missed opportunity i think that's the other thing is like the disappointment of seeing all of the potential that it had. It, you had a you had a great actor coming in. Uh, I mean, you freaking RoboCop. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got all sorts of good elements in there. You, the mu the music elevates that film so much. Like compared to Nemesis being a terrible uh, Next Generation cast movie, music's fine. It's fine. But like when you look at this bad movie, the music in it is just fantastic. I mean, the performances are great by all involved, but the story. It, it just lets it down. And the fact that it was such a good opportunity to have a fantastic sequel just makes it hurt that much more. As you can tell, we are very upset. Yes. This no, I did not like no, that film at all. Could, if you were to take Into <laughs> Darkness and take everything Wrath of Khan related out of it. Yeah. And make it a movie about Admiral Robocop. Yep. And the idea that, you know, you now live in a world in a Starfleet that's more militaristic because this timeline was essentially kicked off by an unprovoked alien attack that destroyed a Starfleet vessel. And like, this is the, this is where you've, you've already established that this is a more cautious and a more wary and a more aggressive Starfleet and yeah. make it a movie about this admiral, admiral who's trying to manipulate the Federation into a war with the Klingons in order to boost Starfleet's uh, importance in the world and to build it up as a military presence. Like that's a good movie. Yeah. That's a really good Star Trek movie, but they had to like junk it on top of this half-ass remake of Wrath of Khan. It was so frustrating. 